serving the universe and beyond. WWRL covers the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut area at 1600 AM and the world at WWRL1600.com. It's Thursday morning, now live from the cosmopolitan capital of the world, New York City. It's the WWRL Morning Show. Now, sitting in for Mark Riley this morning, Richard Bay. And it's 8.07 in the morning on a brisk autumn uh, New York morning. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around, or if you're just joining me on the air, I'm Richard Bay filling in for Mark Riley. Today, tomorrow, uh, Monday, Ron Daniels will be here, Professor Ron Daniels, and Tuesday, Mark returns to the air waves on uh, WWRL. Let me remind you that you can join in on the discussion by calling 212-868-0975. Now, we just went through this uh, this whole deb- debacle with shutting down the government. Are we going to pay the bills for the money that the Congress already spent? Uh, and uh, I, 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 will we go through this again? Because there's a chance that we might. We just kicked this can down the road. I think it's until January. Uh, But in order to avert that, um, Congress, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate are getting together to try to come up with an overall budget so we can avoid this kind of um, crisis management when it comes to the economy of the country. Um, Senate Budget Committee Chairwoman Patty Murray is meeting with the House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan. They're trying to argue you know, argue, I should say. They're trying to work things out. (laughs) But they certainly do come from, uh, you know, different positions. Uh, Joining me on the air right now is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. He's a Democrat representing New York's 8th Congressional District. He's a member of the House Budget and Judiciary Committees. And uh, Congressman Jeffries, are you there? Good morning, Richard. Hey, good morning to you. Great to have you on. Before we get into this discussion about the budget... I, I'm just looking here at your district, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Heights, Brownsville, Canarsie, East New York, Ocean Hill, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Canarsie, East Flatbush, Marine Park, Mill Basin, and Coney Island. Man, you have, you know, uh, what do they call a beautiful mosaic of, uh, Absolutely. of, of different communities. Mosaic of all that Brooklyn and New York City <laughs> represents, and in fact, Richard, uh, in addition to those neighborhoods, I also represent a few neighborhoods in Queens, including... Uh, Howard Beach and Ozone Park. Yeah, Howard Beach and Ozone. I grew up in Far Rockaway, so uh, I know uh, Howard Beach very well. Right over the uh, right over the bridge. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us here today. And uh, I, the first question, you know, before we get into what are the uh, you know uh, differences on on this budget and what it means to all of us, is what is your feeling, uh, you know, from being there amidst the other members of the House? Is there a real possibility that we could maybe not come to a budget agreement and face another uh, shutdown? Are there members of the House who are ignorant enough, I have to say, who would actually risk that a second time? Well, under this Republican-controlled House of Representatives, as we've just seen, anything is possible. And certainly there are some uh, radical, reckless members of the GOP majority over on the House side that don't seem uh, to believe that the government shutdown caused pain to the American people, notwithstanding the fact that objective entities have said it will cost us at least $24 billion in productivity, they seem to ignore that fact. And then there are a few uh, who seem uh, to believe that a default on the United States' debt for the first time in our great history, jeopardizing our full faith and credit, would not be problematic. So are you saying that it, it could be possible that we will do a retread on this? Well, I think your question is important in that uh, we have to assume anything is possible given that there are some Uh, who are disconnected from the reality around the consequences of a government shutdown and a debt ceiling default. However, I am cautiously optimistic that there are reasonable people uh, on the Republican side who understand that great damage was done to the country and to their party over the last uh, few weeks, and that pursuing that course of action again would be foolhardy. There's a couple of other things that I think are important to note, which may make things different this time around. As you know, Richard, uh, the funding mechanism that was put into place on October 16th uh, will expire on January 15th of next year. At the same time, however, a second round of sequestration budget cuts are scheduled to take effect. The important difference is whereas during the first year of sequestration, 
uh, non-defense discretionary spending on programs like uh, Head Start and public housing and women, infants, and children, nutritional assistance, Meals on Wheels, they disproportionately bore the brunt of the pain this year. It's the military. It's the military. Yeah. $20 billion in possible cuts on the military side. Only one point six billion still painful, but one point six billion on the non military. So the side. pressure is on the Republicans. That's what right. You would say. But let me tell you this, and this is this is one of the bugaboos that even at the time it took place, I said, Oh my God, this is not a good idea. Sequestration which was supposed to come up with an alternative that was so painful for both sides. On one side, we're cutting discretionary uh, spending for important programs for people. On the other side, it's military spending. The equation has changed. The Tea Party doesn't care about military spending. They want cutbacks in the military. They don't want the uh, America to be the policeman of the world. They don't. They don't care if we have eleven aircraft carriers or nine. Really, uh, I mean, look at Rand Paul and 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 the Tea Party people speaking out, saying, "Oh, what we have to do is cut, 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 cut." And they don't really. It's not painful for them to cut the military. What should have been part of the sequestration is you either get a revenue increase uh, uh, coupled with uh, discretionary spending cuts. You know that now that's something that all Republicans you know squawk at and repeat over and over again. We don't have a uh, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. Obviously, we have both. Uh, now, could you comment on 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 my assessment of that? Well, we certainly have both and. The Democratic position on the Budget Committee and in the broader Democratic conference under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi and over on the Senate side with Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer is that we need a balanced approach to dealing with our long-term deficit problem. And that has to involve a mix of both revenues and targeted spending cuts, but doing it in a manner that's sensitive to the fragile nature of our economy. Richard, you also touch on an important point in terms of the different factions within the Republican Party. And I think that uh, many have observed they're in the midst of a civil war right now, hopefully a civil war that doesn't wind up resolving itself in a manner that hurts the American people. But nonetheless, it is a civil war. And there are three factions that are involved. You've got the Tea Party faction. They unfortunately prevailed in this government shutdown strategy earlier this month. But that's just one faction. You have the big business faction. They re- recently lost. But now you are starting to see establishment Republicans closely tied to big business interests trying to reassert uh, some authority within the party. And then you've got the defense uh, faction that traditionally uh, have supported increased, not reduced, but increased defense spending. And what's unclear over the next few months is what factions are going to prevail. (laughs) I mean, this sounds like Syria. You know, you, you know, you don't know which army represents Al Qaeda, represents the Free Syrian Army, represents Assad, and, and, or or Libya. You know, with the militias running around. You don't know who, which which side any you know represents the the totality of the situation. It's or a which, complicated situation. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it certainly is. But let me ask you, when it comes to revenue, this doesn't mean that you have to raise tax rates. Uh, The mortgage deduction uh, costs the American economy $414 billion a year. The charity deduction, $170 billion. Capital gains, if we we taxed it as as income instead of at a preferred rate, you'd get $39 billion. Uh, You know, I I mean, isn't there a way uh, here, the step up, the inheritance taxes, uh, there's a there's an accounting trick called the step up, uh, which is worth sixty two billion dollars, six to sixteen billion dollars for hedge fund managers because they're able to count their income as capital gains, four billion to the oil companies. Can't you cut back some of these loopholes and dedicate them maybe if it, uh, to placate the Republicans, dedicate them to uh, 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 the debt reduction? I mean, there there are certainly, and you just listed a significant number of tax expenditures or loopholes that uh, either should be scaled back, cut altogether, uh, or closed in the context of loopholes, for instance, uh, for big oil and gas companies, which are making record profits, yet continue to benefit uh, on the backs of the American taxpayer in ways that are completely unreasonable. Well, maybe I'm maybe I'm asking the impossible here, but can you tell me? Can you, can you tell me why Republicans insist that the debt 
is an immediate problem that must be solved, you know, this very minute or or maybe even yesterday. But we don't want to raise money by cutting a four billion dollar deduction to the oil company or or a sixty two billion dollar inheritance tax trick or the hedge fund trick or I mean if it's so immediate, if it's a disaster, shouldn't we do everything we can to pay down that debt? We absolutely should. And the president himself has asked this question. If there is such great urgency in dealing with a matter that is portrayed often by my friends on the Republican side as a national emergency in terms of the deficit and the debt, we should be putting everything on the table. But instead, this is what reveals uh, some of the disingenuous nature of the rhetoric coming from the other side, they want to remove revenue tax expenditures and corporate loophole closures right. from the equation. Here's the other thing, Richard, that's problematic. The Paul Ryan budget slashes the top tax rate on wealthy Americans from 39.6%, which is the rate that it was at during the boom years of the Clinton administration right. and was recently restored by President Clinton. They want to slash that to 25%. And so the old stale trickle-down economics that proved to be a disaster and a failure under George W. Bush's administration helped to plunge us uh, into a recession in terms of the mindset that took place, laissez-faire as it relates to the economy. Uh, They want to resurrect. This is currently, this is what Paul Ryan will be advocating for right now. And so, in some ways, uh, our friends are operating in an alternate universe in terms of reality. Uh, Congressman Jeffries, I spend all my time repeating that over and over and over again. But one thing I want to just work back on a minute. For Republicans to say, we're going to, oh, we want to negotiate. We're going to come to the negotiating table. But we are not going to even discuss all of these you know, other ways that we could reduce the debt. That's like going to a football game and saying, I want to play football against, my team wants to play against yours, but we're only going to play on your side of the field. (laughs) Right. Uh, Listen, and here's part of the problem, too. This whole negotiating uh, mantra as it relates to the Democrats' alleged unwillingness to engage in a discussion has always been fictitious. Uh, We've been asking for a budget negotiation since March which is when the House Republicans passed their budget and the Senate Democrats thereafter passed their budget. But the Republicans, since March, have refused to appoint negotiators. It is only in the context of this crisis that they finally decided to sit down and have a conversation. Now, I'm glad that they have, but everything has got to be on the table. And the last point that I'll make, Richard, on this, on, in this area, is that a lot of the debt problem that we face in America, and $16.7 trillion is significant, But the debt problem was accumulated under this uh, Congress in terms of the people who were in place during the Bush years authorizing two wars, the Bush tax cuts, uh, giveaway to some in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and then the resulting collapse of the economy. That's what's responsible for a significant amount of the debt problem that we have right now. Well, I, I wish more Americans really understood that, and I wish our media better explained that uh, to the American people. But, Congressman Jeffries, I, I thank you for a great interview. I mean, you were, you were very precise. You were right on, and I can only um, state that it seems to me that your constituents are well served by you, and I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat representing New York's 8th Congressional District. I'm Richard Bay. You're going to have.